All right. Welcome to Coffee with Mark. Uh, I know that many of you thought Marcus was going to be here today, and that was a plan, uh, but something has come up, and I have decided to fill some big shoes. So it's going to be me, Mark Hodge, today, and I have a fun session in store. Uh, I think it's going to be a great session to wrap up the, well, last coffee with Mark or Marcus for 2021. So taking a look at what we're going to cover today, we're going to take a look at the markets, of course, see what's going on, see what's moving, and uh, you know, have some fun there. We'll also cover what to do heading into the trading year, which is important, or into the new year, because there are a few things I think everybody should look at. And I often have a question, the question, what are you doing heading into the year? And uh, there are a few things that, that might not be 100% obvious, and we're going to discuss this so you know what you should be doing. And then I'm going to answer your questions, of course. If questions pop up about the markets in general, also what to do heading into the trading year, we'll tackle those. And then we'll give a test so you know whether or not you're a trader. And th this part's super important. So stick around. Everybody should follow along. And we're going to get right into Coffee with Mark in this just This show is about real money and real trades. I'll show you the trading strategies that I personally trade, the tools that I use to trade my own accounts, and we will talk about the right mindset of a trader. Now, talking about mindset, I'm going to show you how to create SRC profits. And SRC stands for systematic, repeatable, and consistent, because that is the key to long-term success in the market. So if you are sick of all the hype and empty promises, and you want to learn trading strategies that actually work, then Click on like right now and let's get started. All right, so let's see what's going on in these crazy markets. And we see that for today, the S&P is up just about two points. We mentioned earlier today that things were a little quiet and we expected things to be quiet as we head into the end of the week and also the end of the year. The Dow is up just four points right now and uh, really just trading flat at this point. And then the NASDAQ is up 44, 45 points. So for today, the NASDAQ leading the way up 0.3%. So looks like a positive day right now. This could change, but with about 25 minutes to go before the close, unless there's a big sell-off going into the close, we're probably gonna finish relatively flat, maybe up just a little bit, and that's where we're at. Now, we've talked about the, the Santa Claus rally here, and I wanna bring up a, a site, because I, I thought this was interesting. So, this is a, an article on Market Watch. Let me go ahead and make that full screen. So, with Market Watch, they clarified what we already know, uh, that Santa Claus rally really tends to, to be defined as the final week of December in the first two trading sessions of the new year. And we're actually off to the best start uh, this week with today wrapping up and then tomorrow going back to the year 2000. So on Monday, we had a real strong start, a real nice gain with the market up. And if we look here at the strongest starts uh, where we had a 1% gain or higher, we only had a handful of times where Monday kicking off the Santa Claus rally period, the market was up 1% or more, the highest being 2000, the next going back to 1929. And we could see that with Monday, well, I'll take a look at the S&P, Monday, having a nice 1.4% gain right there in some of the best starts for a Santa Claus rally, really of all time, uh, and definitely for a decade or so. We see here that after Monday's big rally, things just have gone kind of quiet though, but, but hanging out. And if I bring up the SPY, the SPX doesn't have volume, but the SPY, since it's an ETF, does have volume. And we see here, that if, if we look at the volume of November, we look at 
the sharp increase in volume towards the end of November and also heading into December, a lot of volume, a lot of activity uh, over the, the first couple of weeks of December, but volume has been just trickling lower and lower, and that's to be expected. Historically speaking, we see that volume uh, during the Santa Claus rally is about 30% lighter than normal, and that's that's been the case, and it definitely looks like it's the case today where volume here uh, is really so far the lowest we have seen since November 11th, and before that goes all the way back to August. So light volume, uh, some, some lower ranges uh, here. And right now it, it seems like we're just gonna kind of drift into a, a sideways or quiet period as we wrap up the week. But there is trading tomorrow. The exchanges are open. Historically, the exchanges are closed it's a, or it's a holiday session uh, for the 31st of December, but with it being a Friday, there are some uh, scenarios for accounting purposes where the market might be open, and that's what's going on uh, tomorrow. So there is some trading. The exchanges are open, but uh, we expect some light trading. You know, there's a good calendar here. I'm going to just bring it up. I'm going to search for NASDAQ holiday calendar because sometimes with your broker, uh, if your broker allows you to trade different vehicles like futures, futures have some really weird calendars because there are different futures products with open outcry and now everything's mostly gone electronic, but it, it's still just really difficult to figure out what's what when it comes to the holidays and futures. And, and this one is as straightforward as it gets. So we see here that uh, this actually is 2022 here um, and we could go back to 2021 if we wanted. Uh, 2021, uh, no holiday on the 31st. But if we take a step back and we look at the the you know upcoming holidays for 2022, we now see that January 17th uh, markets are closed. So anyway, anyway, the S&P future markets just kind of going sideways. Not a whole lot of activity, and uh, you know Santa Claus. So far, the rally is intact. And we will see Monday and Tuesday if that can continue uh, or if we're going to see a bit of a, a Grinch uh, New Year. Uh, but so far, that is not the case. So far, that is not the case. So let's talk about my open positions. And I want to bring up Boeing. This is one that both Marcus and I are in. So Boeing here, Boeing trading at $203.43.42 today. Uh, jumped up a little bit, real sideways, you know, quiet session today, just down, you know, 24 cents, which is nothing for Boeing. Marcus and I, we are both assigned at 207.50. This is where we sold puts. And my break even is actually below $200 a share. So uh, if I sell calls at 207.50 or higher, then I'm collecting more premium. If I sell calls above, 20750 I'm making money on the stock. Right now I have sold the 20750 call uh, uh actually no. Uh yeah, I sold the 20750 for this week. Marcus did the same. He actually got out of his 20750 call today. He decided to buy it back at 90% max profit. I decided to go ahead and keep it for now. Uh I don't see myself selling calls for next week at least unless there's uh, a, a drift higher tomorrow. Uh, and, and so I thought, you know what, I might as well keep it, squeeze out the last 15 cents, and then reassess things on Monday. Now, that's my plan right now. But if tomorrow morning we see that Boeing's rallying and I could roll it for just a huge, huge credit, I might consider doing that. But at this point, I'm really kind of winding down here trading-wise as we wrap up the year and, and getting excited about the new year. So we both have Boeing and we both sold the 207.50 uh, calls here, but Marcus is out, so he just owns the stock right now, and I still have the 207.50 that's expiring tomorrow. Let's take a look at a few others that we are in. Uh, CELH is a Power X trade that we put on, and CELH, uh, the, the signal occurred back here, and then it triggered, it had a real nice rally, and it's kind of going sideways for now. 
Uh, I want to say markets traded the stock, but I actually traded the January 21st monthly expiration 75 call. So I have the 75 call right now. It's up 40, 50 cents last time I looked. So making a little bit of money. Uh, it's a power X trade. So we use our power X exits, you profit target, uh, stop loss based on the software or a black bar exit, meaning a possible change of direction. Right now we're still in this trade and no exit so far. We could take a look at a few more that we are in. LVS, LVS, uh, really interesting here because uh, we were, we originally got into this thing at 58. And LVS, although it's, you know, has a huge market cap for its industry, LVS just hammered with the, uh, you know, COVID situation and people not going to casinos, uh, some restrictions, travel restrictions. And then there was um, a, a, not an investigation, but basically a regulatory situation where uh, the government was looking at casinos in Macau, where El, uh, Las Vegas uh, has their biggest operation. And that just snowballed into this bigger slide. But if you ever want to know how to manage rescues, definitely take a look at some of the videos, uh, the Coffee with Marcus videos that Marcus has done. Because although this was a pretty significant slide, and although this trade has really lasted a lot longer than we had wanted it to, I think this is really a, a classic example of what to do if you're in this situation with the wheel. So we originally saw that there was a pullback you know, towards the pandemic lows, right? And so we did a partial rescue mission at the 39th strike. Uh, rescue missions in detail, a little too much for today's session, uh, but Marcus does have Coffee with Marcus videos on it. So we bought some shares at 39 and then it rallied. It was looking good. It had to get back up, you know, towards you know, up here in this range uh, for it to be profitable. Instead, it turned back around and it made a new low for the year and, and we were looking at selling puts or at this level we actually were able to collect some premium down at these levels before it bounced back but on the the comeback trail here it never made it back into winning territory and then it retested these lows while it was retesting these lows we did another partial rescue and we were assigned at 35 with a partial rescue so based on that assignment, our, our cost basis on the trade is up here. My break even is right around 44. I need to look it up to be exact, but uh, we see here that, okay, getting back up to $58, that's gonna be tough, right? That's gonna be a chore. It's unlikely that that will happen anytime soon. But we have this nice range between 34 and, and 39. And it tested that at the uh, a couple days ago, pulled back a little bit. Marcus has put on a, a different type of trade where he could be profitable if it rallies between 38 and 41. Um, I'm gonna reconsider that at the beginning of the week. But we're moving back into, if we get back into this range, right? Sometimes stocks tend to, to find safety and comfort in ranges. And when we're in this range, eventually we're gonna break out. It's a good thing that it's in this upper part of this range. If we break to the upper range, I could see us trading in this range between 39 and 42, and then it doesn't take much to get back to a point where we're making money on the trade. And I do believe that what we're seeing with Omicron and some of the scenarios uh, overseas that sure, uh, Omicron, Delta variant, COVID, it is a concern, it is having an impact on travel. But as we go into the new year, I, I do believe that there's a lot in place to counter that. And it, it's, you know, we have a new normal, right? Three years ago, all of this, what we're, we're experiencing now, we wouldn't know what to do. But now we've, de we've dealt with it uh, long enough that I do believe we're going to see some progress here. LVS, actually one of the biggest losers in the S&P for the year, right? One of the top five losers. But I think that LVS still has a little life in it, especially maybe the first quarter, let's say, of uh, 2022. And you could mark my words on that one. So that's where we're at with LVS. Both Marcus and I are in that trade. We also both have UNG. So 
UNG is an interesting situation. And we were looking at this because, you know, going back to the idea of ranges and markets finding comfort, right? So we had this big run up. We had a pullback. We broke the new highs, making new highs, making lower lows or higher lows at the time, actually. And it looked like we had some support around 17. One of the reasons why I liked UNG when we put the trade on is that UNG historically has almost no correlation to the overall markets, right? So if the S&P's up, UNG doesn't care. If the S&P's down, UNG doesn't care, typically speaking. Now, in this case, we did break down here. I expected us to stay in this range a little bit longer, but that wasn't the case. So the, the question is, what do you do, right? What do you do if the trade goes against you? I'm not panicking on this one, but we have broken into a new range here. We're trading between maybe 12 and 1350. And this is why looking at my break even, uh, which is my average share purchase price, which is 1550, deducting all of the premium I've collected with the wheel, what can I do? What can I sell here where I could collect as much premium as possible, maybe get called away, but really continue to lower my break even. And that's where I decided to sell the 14 call. So I sold the 14 call. My break even now is about, I uh, I think it's 1363. So my break even on this trade is just at this upper part of the range. Marcus decided to sell the 1450 call this week. He was a little more optimistic where he wanted to make a little more on the, the trade if UNG were to rally. It has not. It's dipped back below uh, 12 bucks, having a rough day today, but still in this range. So we'll reassess this next week. Nothing to do uh, today, but we're in a situation where we've been in this trade. We've broken down into these new levels, and I, I want to be a little more aggressive, at least with how I'm approaching the trade, because I, I would like to get out of this one, uh, you know, first couple of weeks of January. I... Uh, this one's a little more volatile, a little more of a wild card in my book compared to LVS, right? LVS has been beaten up, don't get me wrong. But I, I, I really am optimistic on LVS, especially if I look at the first quarter of the year. UNG, it's, it's more of a wild card. So I do want to collect uh, as much premium as possible, lower my break even, maybe get called away in the first couple of weeks of the year. So that's where we're at with UNG. These are the four wheel trades that I'm in, and then we also have the CLH, CL, C E L H Power X trade that's that's doing okay. Uh, it's hanging in there, and right now I, I really don't expect anything tomorrow, but I will be focusing on some of the things that I want to discuss now. So let's go back and let's take a look at the slides, and I want to run through a few things. So what you need to know heading into the new year and this might not be or the answer might not be what you would expect because i believe that what you need to know for the new year isn't this magic recipe that this magic oh hey here's the the amc for 2022 or here's that 10 bagger or bitcoin's gonna double i think what to do for the new year is going to be based on what you did the previous year, right? So many people are looking to turn the corner and be done with the year, whether they were profitable or whether they struggled or whether they were just getting started. They're looking ahead. They're looking forward, which is great, right? But what worked? What didn't work? You know, how, how, can you, how can you prepare yourself for the new year? And, and this is where I think that the first step is to review your trading log. If you do not have a trading log, start now and actually go back. If you're risking money in the market, put one together. Take some time to, to put together a log with all of your trades for 2021. It's going to take some time, but this is going to help you with your trading. It's the record keeping for your trading business. Make sure it's up to date. Uh, and then review trades. Were there trades that were not according to plan? Now, this is kind of difficult if... You decide to put together a trading log at the end of the year, right? It's easier when you're managing it throughout the year. But throughout the year, if you know that you messed up, you had trades that did not go according to plan. Did not go according to plan doesn't mean, oh, I, I wanted a win and it was a loss. That's that's not according to plan or not according to plan. 
Uh, according to plan means you followed your rules. You executed the trade perfectly from entry to exit, right? So if a trade was not according to plan, why did you have issues with the entry? You know, maybe you you uh, made a mistake with uh, placing the trade and maybe you got a horrible fill or maybe you were looking at entering based on a particular strategy and you shouldn't have been in the trade at all. Or maybe you got into the trade and it was working out. You panicked and you took profits early and then it went on to a big profit that you missed out on. Maybe it started to turn south and you decided to just bail and you took a loss on that trade. And if you would have waited a day, it would have been a win, right? So review the trades that, that weren't according to plan. What what was not according to plan and was, was it profitable? Did it help you or did it hurt you, right? And then also, where did your profits come from? Was there a particular strategy that worked well for you? Were there particular markets or stocks uh, or you know tickers that that really outperformed for you? And, and does it look like you can continue to trade those in the new year? Also, where were your losses? Right? Um, if you had unusual losses in, in certain stocks, what what do you see? Are there any patterns? Right? Any any weaknesses with your plan and what you were executing? I mean, these are actually things that I do when I'm reviewing traders uh, trading logs uh, as a coach, right? In in our mastermind program, when I'm working with our mastermind traders, these are the type of things that I'm looking at. So I'm trying to uncover any weaknesses, but also to spot strengths, so we can piggyback those and, and do what's working but then improve upon weaknesses. So it's important to take a look at your trading log. Uh, I'm reviewing mine this week, right? I'm taking a close look at my log and looking at every single trade, looking at what worked, what didn't work. You know, if there were losses according to plan, great. But are, are there similarities, right? Uh, is it that I'm losing in certain sectors or with stocks in certain price ranges or, uh, you know, basically the, the type of stock growth versus, uh, you know, value, right? And these are all things that we can learn from and improve upon and use for 2022, right? So this is important because as technical traders, which I am and which we are when we're using the tools that we have here at Rockwell Trading, we believe that there are repeating patterns in the market. So of course we're gonna look at 2021, see what worked and see what could repeat to be profitable again in 2022. So a few other things here. So, you know, determining for uh, what worked. Well, what worked for you, right? What works for me is really kind of irrelevant to you because if you were doing, uh, you know, taking good trades, regardless of, of the market or the stock, right? Maybe you were trading some crazy, maybe you traded GME all year long and with the way that you tackled GME, you made money. That's great, right? For me, that wasn't how I wanted to trade. And what I saw is that, trading the wheel on good stocks, right? Solid stocks that, that were profitable, that were more value oriented rather than growth oriented, it worked. And being patient and picky also worked, right? There was a period in November where things, you know, October kind of heading into November where you know, the wheel strategy worked very well the entire year, but things were really slow. And I was patient and I was sitting on the sidelines many times, many days, because I didn't like where I could sell puts because things were quiet. There was lower volatility in the market. And that meant that there was lower premium for the options that I was looking to sell. So I had two options, either sell strikes at, at levels that I didn't like or wait. And waiting actually paid off because I have had many, many conversations with traders where they're taking stocks and strikes at prices that I passed on that are now in the hole. They're trying to work their way out of positions where like Boeing, Boeing's no big deal to me, 
right? It, it's I'm actually making money on the trade. I'm, I'm down a little bit based on my my stock entry, right? But I'm fine owning owning Boeing at 207.50 when it's trading at 203.50. I don't want to own like a, a a pen when it's trading at forty dollars and I get it in at sixty five or you know um, another stock that maybe there was earnings where I'm just stepping right into an earnings trap. It slides twenty percent and just being patient and picky, I I stayed out. And so for me, I was rewarded with patience. And so that's something that worked well for me. Uh, it's important to determine what didn't work. And again, don't worry about what didn't work for me. Look at your trading log, look at your trades, figure out what didn't work for you, right? For me, trading the wheel on growth stocks with a little trading history didn't work. And there's probably one ticker that everybody who watches this video knows. I, I hardly wanna say the freaking name of the stock because I'm tired of saying it, but it's Ride, right? When I got into Ride with Marcus, I knew it was an aggressive trade. We actually discussed this. We, we discussed this when we, we had a mastermind call. We were talking about the trade. We were talking through it. And I actually had a conversation the day before, passed on it, and we had a discussion the next day and analyzing it with the information we knew then, it kind of made sense with it the, the asterisk, it, this is an aggressive trade because at the time it sounded like they were going to be the first company to have a truck be available in the market, right? Based on the information we knew then. Based on the short sellers report that came out and all of the BS that happened with their executive team, we know that that wasn't true. That wasn't the case. But I can't, I, I can't like predict whether or not there will be a short sellers report or whether the executive team for a company might be misleading the public. But what I can do, th this is where I'm in control. I knew that this was an aggressive trade going in. I stated that. I accepted it. And I said with Marcus, you know, let's give this one a shot. Well, I realized, you know, re assessing all of the trades that I took during the year that worked versus the ones that, that didn't, or maybe they worked, but they just tied up too many, too many uh, resources and too much capital uh, for the, the gains that were realized. I realized that trading the wheel on growth stocks with a little trading history doesn't make sense, right? Uh, historically speaking with Power X, we wanna see that there are two years of trading activity. Uh, you know, one to two years of trading activity, I think is a, a really good rule of thumb if you're using uh, technical decisions to, to get into the market, right? Uh, you're, you're not solely relying on um, the, the numbers of the company and, and with a growth stock, it could be that they're losing money, you know, quarter after quarter. So you can't rely on that. Um, and this is where having more trading history um, is, I've, I've really decided it's important, um, but then also focusing more on values. So um, let's take a look at another thing. So what have you learned, right? Um, for many of the people that I've worked with this year, it's patience. And, and that's one of the things that I, I know we really emphasize in, in our, our mastermind group, but it's difficult. It's difficult to be patient with trading because you have three positions, long, short, and on the sidelines, right? Now, being on the sidelines doesn't make you money, but it can save you money, right? It could keep you out of bad trades that you step into when you're not patient. But it's difficult to be on the sidelines because making a decision to not make money today is difficult. But you're really saying, I don't want to lose money today, right? It's it's like, you know, one little tick, uh, trick that I've, I've taught some traders from time to time is consider buying the trade, right? When you're looking at a trade, too many people get into the trade and they think that they're just going to make money, Right? They're, they're just going to make money. L let's say that you want to buy X number of shares and you think the stock's going to go up. So you think you're going to make a killing. But what if you had to pay $500 for that trade, 
right? What if you had to, like, you give your broker this money, but it's all electronic, so you don't feel it, right? You don't feel the pain handing $10,000 over to your broker and actually seeing a stack of cash and physically handing it to your broker to put the trade on. Instead, it's a click of the button. That $10,000 is now in your account, kind of, but it's tied up in the trade, right? So what if, what if instead you had to buy the trade? What if you physically had to either hand the full amount over to your broker and say, you know, I'm, you know, to go to the, go to the shop, give them the 10,000 walk away. You're probably going to feel a little more involved and have a little more ownership in that trade. Right. I, I use the $500 analogy, like, um, like a stop loss, right? Because too many people get into the trade, think, Oh, I'm just going to make money on this, even though they're using a stop loss. But basically what you're saying is I'm willing to pay 500 bucks or whatever, whatever the risk is on your stop loss. I'm willing to pay this amount for the trade to work out. And if you are giving that up to begin with, then if the trade's working out, that's okay. But if it's not working out, you should be fine with that too because you already paid for it. You paid for it up front, right? Just a little, little trick there. If you find that you are not being patient, you're getting into trades that you shouldn't, because you're assuming it's automatically going to work out instead of doing the discipline and due diligence to make sure that for you, it makes sense. It's appropriate for you. And you could, you should kind of consider yourself in the hole as soon as you put the trade on. And then the trade has to earn its way to break even and profitability, not start with break even, right? So anyway, what have you learned this year? Uh, the need to be more patient, uh, maybe avoiding meme stocks. Honestly, this is something I've worked with so many traders this year when the the AMC GME thing was going on. It was hard as, as traders. It's hard for Marcus and I to stand by and just watch all of this money going by at times because it, it's like exciting. It's like, hey, should we participate in this craziness? Right. But we also know that it's often a trap. Right. It's easy to get stuck. It's easy to see what happens at the end of the day, like, oh, the stock is up 100%, but then not realize that the getting in and getting stuck in that trade, that just as it fell from 450 or whatever to 150, whatever it's at now, there were buyers at 450, right? And, and so I've worked with more traders this year. I, I guarantee this. It's probably 90% of the traders that traded meme stock that I worked with, probably more, lost money trading the meme stocks. And that, that, that's an honest statement that's true based on the people that I talk to. Most traders lost money. Um, I have a trader that actually was took a trade based on another very popular trader in the industry and uh, was short calls on GME when it exploded overnight. And he instantly lost like $80,000 with a naked call, something around those numbers, right? Instantly gone. Right, we don't trade naked calls for a reason. Um, but this is why just just avoid the meme stocks. That that's something that I've learned because even though I was tempted at times, I realized that it's not worth it. it this will end badly. Um, another thing that I learned, and this is something that I knew, but it's difficult when you're trading the wheel. Assignment equals money, right? And and part of this is the approach that we take to get into the trade. Because when we get into the trade, we're selective with the stock and we're also very selective with the strike that we are selling. That strike that we are selling is the price that we're looking to buy shares at if we get assigned. And I found time and time again that assignment equals money. So many times traders, they're, uh, they're afraid to get assigned um, because they're, you're always going to get assigned on uh, after a stock is losing, right? After a stock is falling. Um, unless you're trading at the money uh, puts. But if you sell puts below the market, which is what we like to do, we like to collect the premium, right? Options volume is at a historic highs. There's so many people trading options right now. But what I know from, as a fact is that there are traders gambling on low priced options that are out of the money and I can be the house, right? I could be the insurance company. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take those premiums over and over and over and over and over again 
Sure, there might be a disaster that comes through every now and then, but we know it's always not as bad as it sounds when it's approaching. And then after the dust settles, it's profitable too. So assignment means money. So those are things that that um, I have learned. And, and I really want you to think about based on your year, based on the trades that you took, based on the review that you do of your trading log, what have you learned from trading? And then what are your goals for 2022? What are you looking to achieve? How much money do you want to make, right? But but not just a dollar amount when it comes to goals. What about personal and, and business growth? What about education? What about your three buckets? If you don't know what three buckets are, then definitely take a look at the last uh, Coffee with Marcus that Marcus did because it's a great session on you know trading uh, as for as a living essentially, and then also investment allocation and money, and then crazy idea money. So your crazy idea money doesn't get involved with the other two buckets, because, but a lot of people, they, they have it all ordered incorrectly, where the crazy idea money is the most important to them, and then they're wondering why they're losing, and then they're not putting enough money in the other buckets. Um, so it's a, it's a great session. It's a great session. So I would suggest that you Take a look at it and really make a decision on what your goals are for 2022, but not only what your goals are, how you will achieve those, right? So maybe you need, you know that you need to have a little more money to achieve your financial goals with trading or even with investing. So does that mean you need to fund it a little bit more, like fund your account more? Uh, one thing is money management. Maybe if you are seeing success, if you're seeing su uh, consistency, you could be a little more aggressive with money management to grow the account. That's something that's possible. But many times traders feel that they're, they're trapped with their account size when just a little extra work can help fund it, right? Um, Marcus in his last session, he, he gave some ideas. I mean, even if you have to go on a crazy eBay, eBay seller uh, month to put a little extra money in your account, I mean, don't, you know, figure out how to do it. There, there are ways. There are ways. Um, also, how will you achieve your goals? Well, if you haven't been reaching your goals, maybe you need to focus on your tools, right? Is, is there something missing? Is, is there something lacking? And then what tools are available? What, what tool? You know that we use PowerX Optimizer for PowerX Trades and the wheel. Um, and Marcus has a goal of making it the best software out there, period, right? I, I think that many people that, that I've talked to say it's the best software, but we want to make it the best hands down. So there's there's no comparison. There There's no... There's no, well, I like this one for this and, and this for this and this software. PowerX is a good fit. We just want it to be the best hands down. And Marcus is constantly investing in it. But maybe there's another tool that's a better fit for you for your style of trading. That's okay. I want you to succeed. It doesn't matter. But maybe you need to invest in tools to help you reach your goals. And, and what tools would those be? And then there's just education. And I know that many people are here for the education, which is which is fantastic, right? But, you know, what are, is there something that you need to do education-wise to bridge the gap, right? And sometimes people are afraid to invest in education or themselves. But I think that that is one of the best investment decisions that you could make because education buys time, right? I know working with a trader that I could help them achieve in three months what would take them three years to achieve you know, maybe probably at a minimum. And that's because you, you, when you try to do it all on your own, you're reinventing the wheel over and over and over and over again. And someone with more experience can steer you in the right direction and, and catch those weaknesses that you have early on. Anyway, so I, I'm going to, I know that there were a bunch of comments. I'll try to take a look at as many of those as I can. And we do have the trader test coming up. Um, but just, uh, just to kind of do a one takeaway from this. Today's takeaway, setting goals is one thing, but a lot of what you need to do in 2022 can be determined by what you did in 2021 and by doing an honest review and analysis of yourself. And bottom line, do the work and you'll have a great 2022. Now, I, I know that there's this, are you a trader quiz that I'm going to get to, but I, I just want to see um, questions wise um, if uh, an you know what? I just realized here. So this is one of my goals for 2022 is 
I have been helping Marcus with the uh, stock market updates in the morning, right? So I've been very active there, but 90% of the time Marcus is running things on his computer and I'm just joining right through uh, software where he could rebroadcast me and then we put together this video. Now the Coffee with Marcus video, I was using this software that was very, very, very basic and, and simple um, and I, I was very limited with what I could do. So I've started to use this uh, more advanced software, you could say, where it has more bells and whistles and I haven't even you know scratched the surface of what I could do. But it, it's similar to what Marcus is already using, but I don't have the experience that I should with it. And so I just kind of uh, am winging it a little bit today. Um, one of those things is being able to share comments. So I need to figure out how to do that. Um, I apologize, uh, but I will get to it. Um, and I want to first bring up, oh, I might be able to do it this way. Let's see. Uh, maybe not. Um, so Michael says, stop loss works for equities. Options, I'm not sure about the stop loss. So I mean, this, is, I think, is a great comment. And Marcus and I, with, like with PowerX, we could trade calls. We could buy calls as an alternative to the stock. Right. But we like to watch the stock to decide when to get out of the option. So I personally don't like using stop losses and profit targets on the options. But part of this is because I'm OK trading options that might have to, you know, if you have like penny bid ass spreads and it's moving just like a stock, it probably isn't that big of a deal to use targets and stops. But I'm okay trading options that have a spread of 10 cents, 15 cents, 20, 25, 30 cents, right? But the problem is when you have those wider spreads compared to what you see with stocks, you could get stopped out in a fast market at a horrible fill, right? You, you don't see a stock trading at $100 and then someone gets filled at a penny because they use the stop loss and they're wondering why their $100 stock traded at a penny and they got filled. But you do see times where someone has a stop on an option, right? They're using a stop loss on an option. It's trading at a dollar and there's this weird change in the, the market and there, the bid falls out and you're getting filled at, at 10 cents, right? Where you, you thought, hey, I could get out at 70 cents and you're getting filled at 10 and you're, you're going, what the heck, you know? And, and that's because of how options are traded. It's, it's a different vehicle. Now, the benefit to options is if you are an option buyer, essentially you have a stop loss built into the trade because you cannot lose more than what you've paid for the option. So if you bought an option for $100, you can't lose more than that. So there is a stop loss built in by the purchase. And if you're worried about not using a stop loss, you might want to consider trading smaller size. But I believe that by watching the stock to determine where to get out of the option, you're better off than using stop losses when it comes to options. All right, let's see here. Um, yeah, and then uh, Hopelophile one says, the last couple of months have been tough as the market rotated away from tech stocks. I mean, that rotation, we've seen that the, the NASDAQ stocks, tech stocks are underperforming and some of the, the big favorites of last year, you know, the EV sector, the green sector, energy, and uh, not, not energy as in oil and gas, but alternative energy, they took a bit of a beating. This, I think, is another reason to be real diversified here, right? Where We don't like to trade uh, stocks that are too correlated to one another. So that's something to definitely consider. Because if you're in like United Airlines, Delta Airlines, uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines, and Boeing, there might be a lot of premium to collect. But when that industry gets hit, you're getting hit on everything. It's better to have things spread out a little bit more. All right, let's see here. Jim Ves uh, Vesio says, if I was to do 2021 trading again, I would not change much. It was a great year using Rockwell Strategies. Love that. I know that you did a great job. Thank you for sharing that. And, and yeah, I mean, it's okay if you said, hey, this was a great year, but maybe with that review, there's something you could do a little bit better, right? Um, so it, it's still worth the review, but thank you for sharing. That's great to hear. Uh, happy, happy that that was the case for you. I know it was for other traders as well. 
Um, John Bruton says, Happy New Year. I've learned so much for the from this group in the last three months. Thank you. I'm glad that the channel is of value to you. And uh, with that said, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to our channel so you get updates on new videos and sessions. Um, and also like this video. But I, I think you're going to like my um, Are You a Trader bit, uh, which we're going to wrap things up with in just one minute. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, Dan B says, when a stock pops up in the scanner that you trade, before are you trading it right away or are you checking something like a graph and financials? So if we're talking about the wheel scanner, the wheel scanner finds stocks that have options premium that meet our minimum, our minimum criteria. So we know that the options are okay, but we still want to make sure it's a stock that we want to own. That is the first step. Is it a stock that we want to own? What makes a stock that we want to own? Well, typically we would prefer stocks that are more value oriented rather than growth oriented. And this is where at least in the software at the top of the option information, there's a little uh, megaphone, right? If you click on that, you could bring up news about the company and the financials, and you could look at the last two quarters to see if the company was profitable. I also want to see is there strong support, right? I want to trade stocks that are moving sideways or maybe slightly higher. It's okay if they've fallen a little in a range, but I want to avoid a stock that's tanking. I don't want to try and catch a falling knife. I'd rather trade a stock that, that has established itself in a range where I could sell puts at that support level or lower. All right. Georgia says the software is fantastic. It's my, or fantastic. It's my analytical ability that needs work. Something to work on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where the, the review can really, really help. And also keeping notes each day as you go through when you, you make decisions, right? Uh, always uh, analyze things and, and critique what you're doing. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I know that we ran a little late, so I want to make sure that we get to uh, the most important part here. And I hope you um, you forgive me if this wasn't what you expected. Um, but there have been questions, and one person even asked me the other day, how do I know if I'm a trader? And I want to leave you with this. In the uh, immortal words, in uh, a very uh, appreciative uh, copying of... Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> I leave you with this. You know you're a trader if it's the weekend and you can't wait for it to be Monday. So that's one reason that you absolutely know you're a trader. If you can't wait for Monday uh, to begin and for the markets to open, you're probably a trader. All right. So another one. You know you're a trader if talking about waiting for a dead cat bounce doesn't mean you need to get help. <laughs> if you don't know what a dead cat bounce is, don't look at images, but Google it. A dead cat bounce and trading. <laughs> All right. So you know you're a trader if, if you're talking about the previous day's high and nobody around you is giving you a strange look. <laughs> You know you're a trader if your friend calls and asks you what's up and your first response is the S&P by 20 points. All right, you know you're a trader if getting into a naked call has nothing to do with Zoom and not wearing pants. <laughs> you know you're a trader if your calendar has the important stuff, birthdays, anniversaries, market holidays, and options expiration. You know you're a trader if the Dow is down 2% and you have a smile on your face. I, I've seen that happen many times where the market's just getting hammered and, and people who just have some money in uh, a fund or someone's managing it and they're going, oh my gosh, can you believe the markets are down? And I'm saying, yeah, it was a great day. <laughs> All right, you know you're a trader if your favorite Christmas movie is Trading Places. <laughs> if you haven't watched that one, it's an oldie but a goodie for sure. And it's not just about Christmas. It's a little bit about trading. 
You know you're a trader if you're not getting into trouble when you're talking about double tops and double bottoms. And I leave it with this one. You know you're a trader if it's the day before New Year's and you're watching Rockwell trading videos on YouTube. I'll leave it with that. Everybody, I hope you had a fantastic 2021. I hope you've enjoyed this channel. Please give it a like and subscribe if you have not done so already. I really wish you a healthy and prosperous new year. Let's have a fantastic 2022 and I'll see you on the other side. Happy new year, everybody.